of chemistry, Dr. V.T. Joey, who has bring forward a solar dryer as a part of Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, where IIT Delhi is a nodal agency. And the solar dryer was made as a product which could be given to the farmers of the locality. We also have got an innovation center and also an innovation cell that would be functioning. I especially appreciate Dr. Tom Cherian for organizing these webinars and all the faculty members for coming forward so that this webinar may become a very, fruit, a very fruitful exercise. And up to students, this is you, this is up to you. And the opportunity is for you to get yourself inspired by I would say some of the giants of the research who will be talking to you about the most modern research avenues and the research horizons where they have moved upon by their hard work. And it will be up to you to get yourself inspired for these types of um, webinars by which you will be inspired by these types of webinars so that you can also be um, coming forward and become, I would say, the leading researchers of the tomorrow. Have a wonderful time. My sincere appreciation to all of you. Have a nice time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jolie Andrews, CMI. Uh, now I invite Dr. Devi Chandran for his presentation. Thank you so much for the introduction. It sounds so great. And thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to talk here. So can you see my presentation? Someone say yes or no? Yeah, you're good. Thank you. So as I said about me that my complete name is Ravichan Kolarigoda. I did PhD in metal engineering. Uh, I'm currently working at a National Magnetic Field Laboratory, Tallahassee, Florida. This is a building structure. And the mag lab is the largest and highest board magnet in the world. They produce around I think uh, 1,000 or 500 Tesla power magnets in, in this lab. Uh, I, I think I don't go more about my introduction. They already spoke about me. I'll directly go to the, my topic. So today I'm going to talk on light and uh, force response to smart molecular switches, uh, which we use for the bioengineering applications. Uh, this is my content. So I'm going to talk on what are smart materials, uh, how it works, and the real inspiration for the researchers, how they develop this kind of smart materials, the examples, the selection of molecules, their variety of molecules that exist, and how do we select, and the chemistry behind these smart molecules, and the dynamics of these molecules, how it goes from molecule to the macromolecular dynamics, and the, how do we engineer the material for the application, so if you come to the application, I speak about the tissue engineering application and how do we make a cell filling materials and also how do we construct the surfaces, uh, two dimension surfaces and how do we move the biomolecules or the liquids or some any liquids on the surfaces. This is an overview and someone already spoke about that, how fascinating uh, these smart molecular materials. People has been used in different application because of the uniqueness of the unique characteristic of this material. They use the coating, go from sensor and use the bioengineering, cell engineering, water purification, oil spill, and use the robotics, drug delivery, and the different variety of the applications. So what are smart materials? The smart materials that are manipulate to respond in a controllable and reversible, and it's reversible, modifying some of their properties as a result of external stimuli. In a simpler way, it's change the chemical properties and it's reversible process. And let's look at the simpler way that this molecule exists in two different states that can be reversibly switchable from one to another. The requirements are two stable state from metastable and the reversibility of the switchable molecules and switch is activated by an outside stimulus. So it's changing the chemical properties by using an external stimuli like temperature, uh, light or pH or different condition or stress. And at the same time, its process is reversible. So what's the real inspiration for these smart molecules? The best example is uh, how the nature does. Nature does in a very sophisticated way. So the, this is called pashmina plant. I think most of you are aware of this plant. This is also known as shy plant. When you touch the leaf of the plant, 
from one end, it start folding inward. And after some time, it unfold. So important information here is that how inspired is that, how the informations are transferring from one leaf to another leaf in a fraction of a second. This is actually a touch stimuli response material. This basically mechanism works on the protein molecules. In biology, proteins considered as a energy rich information molecules. The protein molecules are loaded with the complete information. The protein molecules know how to react and how to respond with the different temperature or the different environment. So another example is, the best example is how the biological nanomachines of works in our body. So the best example, DNA, DNA acts as a memory. The nucleus contains information of the protein molecule structures. The ribosome acts as a processor and read and process the DNA information and the proteins and control the functionality of the cells. So the best another example is that how neurons works in our body. So on, when we touch the heart plate, unintentionally, we'll take out the hand. So how it works, when we touch this heart plate, it has a neuron. This is a sensory neuron, send the information to the spinal cord, which has a central nervous system. This information sent to the another neurons. Usually in our body works, when the send information it should send to the brain, but does not work here like that. When the neuron information sent to another neurons, this another neurons immediately responds. Response and this allows ask you to the take out the hand. So the idea is that how do we mimic these kind of materials? How do we create synthetic neurons? Or how do we construct this kind of smart material that which nature created? So this is the structure of the neurons. The neurons has transferred from thermal to the electrical signals. So we have a kind of cell body in the nucleus. This is axon which converts from thermal to the electrical signals. So let's come to the research about what type of smart materials are exist. We have different types of smart materials, which are from physical, chemical, biological, some act as dual. So physical mainly on the temperature, electromagnetic light, or the pressure or force, the chemicals, which are pH, ion, the redox, which are oxidation and the reduction, and the biological have a kind of a glucose, enzyme and information. So today I'm going to talk about the physical in particular, the light and the force. So why the light, I choose that light offers several advantages over the chemical stimuli. It uh, control the spatial and temporal control and it remote addressability, and it is low toxicity compared to other materials. We do, do not need to add any solvent or liquid or chemicals. And implementation is much better compared to other technique if you use a laser as a light source. So there are these are the families of the light triggered smart molecules. People researcher has been discovered so far. I just summarized to look at that what is the behavior, how it the mechanism works. If you consider that we have called uh, diethylene, it is from the closed and the open structure, You're using the UV light and visible light, ring opens and closes, and we have a azobenzene molecules. I'm going to talk more on this molecule. When we end up UV light, it goes folding and unfolding chemistry, and we have a spiroferon. I'm also going to talk about these molecules. We use UV light, it ring opens, and it's visible light at the temperature, it ring closes. And we have like a fumigate, it closed and open structure. And we have alternate families of organic uh, photochemical com compounds and also work with the different isomerization with the UV light or the laser light. And it's called naphthopyran. And we have a dihydroxylene and of indoxolene. And also we have a dihydropyran. This, these are the families currently we exist. And these are light triggered smart molecule switches. Smart molecule switches will be selected and depends on the application. So let's look at the overview that how do we choose the smart material for the application? There's two things which we consider that what are the properties it changes. The one of the main properties change is the polarity. And another one is that what is the wavelength and the cell lifetime from switching from folding or unfolding or ring opening or the ring closing. This is as a benzene which, ring, which folds and unfolds. We have the polarity, it goes from almost three day by, it is considered as a medium chain. It works in UV to visible light and the steel beam is also in the small polarity change. It also works with UV and visible. We have a spire of herons, ring opens and ring close. And we have a U visible, it's a multi-responsive, it responds to temperature, it responds to UV, it responds to solvent, acid, and bases. It provides the large polarity changes. And we have a diarrheal ethene, it has a small polarity changes, it works with UV and visible light. And we have a theophene fusicide, which has 
small polarity changes and it works with UV visible and also hemithion articles, which works with the medium polarity changes. It also works with UV and visible. So today I'm going to talk about the azobenzene and uh, sorry, spirofiron and the azobenzene. So this is a favorite feature among the reported uh, switches. It's a simple synthetic process compared to other molecular switches and it's tunable, the self love switching from minutes to days, you can create a steric hindrance that depends on the requirement. And also it has a good quantum yields. So type of azobenzene, when it comes to the type of azobenzene, you have three types, azobenzene and amino azobenzene and pseudostilfin. It goes from blue shifted to the ref shift and the shelf life switching property, it goes from days in azobenzene. When we go for the pseudostilfin, it happens in the seconds. This works, depends on the steric hindrance, the moiety we created on the backbone of the structure. In 2016, these three people got a Nobel Prize on this kind of preparing azobenzene molecules, and they use this as a molecular machinery. I will explain that how we can create a molecular motors or molecular machinery in the coming slides. So what is the chemistry behind the azobenzene and spirofiron? Azobenzene is a simple organic molecule. We have two aromatic ring with N double bond N. When used appropriate wavelength, this azobenzene undergoes photoisomerization from trans to cis configuration, which is N pi and pi pi excitation. The trans state is a stable one, the cis is an unstable one. So importantly, the dipolar moment changes and this process is reversible. When we come to the spirofiron chemistry, this is organic heterocyclic compound. This hetero compound of electroclavage of the C spiral O bond with the photo excitation, it goes from ring openings, uh, ring closings to the ring opening structure, and it goes from hydrophobic to the hydrophilic of marrozene structure. The chemical property is just not to the hydropolarity, and also there is a small amount of changes in the volume of spirofiron and the marrozene molecules. In detail, the azobenzene length goes from almost 0.9 nanometer to the 0.65 nanometer of the single molecules. So idea is that when we connect the single molecule to the large molecules, macromolecules or polymer chain are cross linked to the gel, how it provokes and how it creates the mass transport. And also it's respond to use the laser light. This, this is a liquid crystal of the azobenzene molecules. When you use a magnetic field, it works so work with the polarized light. It undergoes photosomerization. Sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, could you please uh, reduce the speed a little bit? Uh, okay, yeah. it's a bit fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, Rizal. Thank you for... Uh... Yeah, no worries, yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is the liquid crystal azobenzene molecules. So this corresponds to the polarized light. This azobenzene, when we use the polarized light exact, it undergoes the folding and unfolding chemistry until it orients perpendicular substrate. So this is the idea that when we connect this one into the polymer chain, how it moves and how it can move, goes from molecular to the macromolecular dynamics. This is the example. This is a video, how it works. We have azobenzene molecules. This is a simulation idea that how it folds. And when we create the steric hindrance, how it folds and unfolds. So the inf information of the folding and unfolding will be captured in the first with the UV visible and proton NMR. I'm not going to talk most basic instrument about the, how UV visible works and proton NMR, but I can give you some information how we capture those information and all. This is the optical view of UV visible light. We have a source, it usually uses a tungsten filament. It goes from 200 to 2000 nanometer and we have the cells. So in absorbance, it mostly it works on absorbance on the vertical axis. It's just a measure the amount of light absorbed the higher the value, the more of a particular wavelength is being absorbed. Here in the proton, how is the NMR works? I'm not going to talk about the principle or the mechanism. So when molecules are placed in the strong magnetic field, the nuclei of some atoms will begin to behave like a small magnets. The resonant frequencies of the small of the nuclei are then measured and converted into NMR spectrum which is like an you know, sample have a magnetic, strong magnetic field, which produced by the excitation of the nuclear sample with radio waves into nuclear magnetic resonance, which is detect, de uh, detected and sent to the uh, radio receivers. So how do we study from molecule to the macromolecular level? You can study the three-dimensional way, 
in a two dimensional way three dimensional way will be studied in the solution state and the two dimensional way will be studied on the surface here we choose as a glass as a substrate you can choose a gold silicon or different surfaces the glass is modified grow a polymer brushes this is the optical view of how it looks we have a polymer brushes and we have a side chain which is these are as a benzene molecule and main chain on the top chain we have another dye which is called cy5 cyanin 5 this of excite at 633 nanometer and this excite at 408 nanometer so when we excite this molecule this undergoes photoisomerization and this is the confocal volume we use the fluorescence correlation spectroscopy this is one of the powerful tool in uh, correlations and confocal spectroscopy where you can get a lot of information. So here when we use 488 nanometer are coming from the azobenzene molecule, 633 signals are coming from the cyanin-5 molecules. When we excite it from the lower wavelength, 458 nanometer, we could see that you can see that there is no fluctuation or a dynamics were observed. When we excite it at 488 nanometer, as you can see, there are a lot of fluctuation which are coming from the side chain of the molecule, which are azobenzene. And we increase the 500 nanometer, there are some signals are coming from the azobenzene molecules, but consider that 480 nanometer is the best wavelength to excite this type of azobenzene molecules. How we observe, this is a fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, basic idea. This is a, how it looks like that. We have a confocal volume. This is the one femtoliter small volume, and you use the polymer brushes or the polymer in solution, excited nanometer, the fluorescent fluctuate that gives the fluorescent intensity, which are number of particles with the diffusion time. You can measure the diffusion time and also it provides the concentration of the particles are present in the excited region. So here I should two dynamics observed, the short dynamics and the long dynamics. The short dynamics are coming from the side chain of the azobenzene and the long dynamics are coming from the main chain of the polymer brushes, which is cyanine 5, which read the information. And this process is reversible. It happens in two, in few seconds, it goes from long to short dynamics, but it reverts back after 10 minutes. So it can be controlled by using Raman and AFM spectroscopy. This is a Raman, as you can see that before it have a homogeneous surface, after excitation, it formed aggregated in the excited region. So with Raman can be mapped by using N, N double bond stretching. We have a AFM atomic force microscopy. Before excitation, we have a homogeneous polymer brushes. After excitation, you can see that the aggregation of the polymer brushes and the process after 10 minutes, it's reverse back. The process is reversible. So I will give the information what is AFM and how it works. AFM is an atomic force uh, microscopy. This is the optical view of how it works. The AFM sensor is called cantilever. This cantilever has a small sharp tip near the free end in this region. When the sufficiently close to the sample, the tip is affected by the force at the sample surface. This causes the tip to move, which turn cause the entire cantilever to bend. This cantilever bending or the deflection is detected by the photo detector. And that's how we got the information or the topology uh, on the, of the surface will be captured and will be analyzed. This is what, how it looks, the topology, when we measure the AFM. When you consider the Raman, I'm not going to talk about more detail about the Raman, how we get the information. This is a Raman light scatter. It basically works on scattering technique, where a molecule scatters incident from high intensity laser side source. Most of the scattered light at the same wavelength as a laser source and do not provide any useful information, which is called Raman scatter, rally scattering. However, small, small amount of light, it typically you can point not, not one percentage is scattered at different wavelength, which depends on the chemical structure of the analyte. This is called Raman scattering, which you provide the information. So the, here the question rises that there are other techniques called infrared direct IR and Raman. Why people prefer Raman over IR? You can look into the more information that the best is that IR works mostly on the polarity of the molecules, but the Raman, you can go from the intermolecular and intramolecular vibration bands. So that's one of the reason why people prefer Raman over infrared spectroscopy. 
So molecular to the macromolecular motor, how the spiroferrin chemistry we can understand. This is a spiroferrin ring closing structure. It's a response to the temperature or the light. By using the temperature, it ring opens it from, from the colorless to the color uh, purple color compound. This is a hydrophobic structure. When you ring open, it forms the merosanin structure. You have a phenolite ion and ammonium ion. And use this one is here, the metal ligand chemistry. When we this spiroferrin connected to the polymer chain with a number of repeating units like 500 to 1000, it ring opens. And here he, we use the bivalent metal ion, the D block, mostly we use D block elements. It forms the complex structure. It binds the polymer side chain of the phenolite ion with the metal and we form a gel structure. So we have a, initially, you can have a liquid when we heat it temperature, high temperature with the bivalent metal ion, you can create a gel structure that which create a non-covalent structure. It's not a covalent structure, it's a non-covalent cross-linking compound. It, it keep it room temperature, a dark room, it goes to the liquid state. I will show you how it works with the mechanophores. You can also create a mechanophores and we use create a mechanophores and force, apply the force on the both side. This ring, this ring can open and form the marosin structure. So for this, you can do the simple chemistry of addition with the silane chemistry. And apply the force with PDM spiroferrin, which is cross-linked with the silane. When you stretch, apply the force, it goes from colorless to the purple color, which is the ring opening structure of the spiral, which is marosanin. And after a few seconds, it reverses back. The reverse back process can be tuned by depends on the concentration of the spiroferrin. If you want more concentration of spiroferrin, it takes more time. But if you load the low concentration of the spiroferrin, it happens in minutes to the second. So next that, how do we engineer the material for the, for the application? So engineering can be done using the, by using the gel chemistry. So here we have a spiroferrin with the double bond. So you can also use double bond. You can cross-link with the another cross-link based polymer. This act as a monomer. If you create another double bond, it also act as a cross-linker. So if you create like a gel, gel can be prepared when hydro-organic as well as the hydrogel. If you use a water medium and swell is water, you can create a hydrogel. If you use organic solvents, you can also create an organogel. So here, the, this act as a monomer and you can create the different substitution on the backbone of this pyrophoron structure and depends on the requirement. When we create, create the gel structure. This is a gel with cross-linked with the spiroferrin. When we expose the light, it contrasts, it shrinks. And when you keep it in the dark, it swells. This completely works, depends on the merosanin structure, can be calculated in the amount of net charge. So when we have a net charge, a plus one, use the light, it goes from merosanin to spiroferrin, it contracts 89%. And MS, which is no net charge, it goes expansion happened in 102 percentage. And we have merosanin negative, which is expansion of 103 percentage. And we have merosanin to SP negative two, it expands to 0, 1, 1, 105 percentage. That can be two that depends on the structure and the charge substituted in the backbone of the spiroferon. So how we cross it works. So you create, engineer the material, the real cross-linking gel. This is the real cross-linked gel material with the different material. Sorry. When we expose to the light, it started swelling and the shrinking that create, induce the motion of the material. When we hit with the light, it goes from shrinking state, which folds, which bends at 45 degree. And when it is room temperature or, or, or on dark room, it co comes back. It's same with the different polymer. You can create any different cross-linking network. You can engineer the material with a different concentration of the spiroferon. You can use the light source. It goes from shrinking to swelling state that creates the bending and unbending movement. So, and also you can create a different structure and different morphological of material. Here you can see the folding and the unfolding. You have a kind of flower structure. You use the top of the light. It goes from a shrinking state, it shrinks, 
and it goes to the, when you come to room temperature uh, dark room it starts a swelling state so and also if you can make it a kind of a robotic materials and you can walk on the surfaces you keep expose the light it shrinks and when you keep it in the dark room it swells and comes back so this is how you can engineer the material and you can study the how the molecular movements when it, in the single molecules it just change the color changes and a small amount of volume changes in the molecules which is a length but when we connect it to the polymer chain you can go from the molecule to the macromolecule the level which are kind of an aggregation but you create a cross link gel you can engineer the gel then we go for the real application or you can, you can construct the artificial neurons or artificial material touch responsive material which are like kind of a robotic or kind of a flowering structure, flowers which unfolds and unfolds. So the next is that how do we use this material a kind of a self-filling materials? So self-filling material is kind of a wide subject is itself. So self-filling polymers are systematically created the smart materials which have a built-in ability to automatically repair a damage to the self without an external diagnosis. So the best example, the inspiration, the how self-filling materials that are inspired by the biological systems in our body. So let's see how we can create that one. So the hair is like undamaged network. This is a polymer network. We have created material. You physically damage, you break the material and keep allow the reaction to happen like a diffusion or a low molecular weight segment, the mobility and the conformation changes to bring that one and the, how the bond reformation of the network or the repair can happen. There are different types of self-filling materials that exist. We have kind of a covalent and the non-covalent one. So we have a kind of different, the covalents basically as a mutual sharing of electrons works. They have a kind of immune bond formation, also hydrogen bonds, boronic bonds, and have a Diels order reaction, which is the first self-filling material and disulfide bonds, oxygen bonds. The hydro, like a non-covalent bonds are like a hydrophobic interaction, the hydrogen bonding interaction, the host guest chemistry and the ionic bonds. The non-covalents are like a physical interactions. So yes, of course it has us work as a self-filling material, but the self lifetime, lifetime of compared to the covalent bonds is low because it's not covalent bonds. After certain time, it start breaking or breaking the bond with the host gate material or ionic interaction or the hydrophobic interaction. So created the right. they also prepared, created the tire response, dye responsive, reference responsive of the materials, create the polymeric network with smart materials like a base using the azobenzene or the spiraferrin molecules with which can create the hydrogen bonding interaction or hydrophobic bond interaction, break the material and keep material over the time from zero time to number of days, it self fills each other. So we created that dry state, wet state. This is a dry state and also we created the wet state, how it works. So that dry, in the wet state with the place, place of no materials and you keep it in the solution, it forms the hydrophobic interaction and ionic interaction. It can start heat, heal each other. And if you're in the hydrogen bonding in a dry state, it creates the trio responsive, which has a hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic interaction and also ionic interaction, it helps each other. And also can measure the mechanical properties, which is engineering the stress and versus the strain. So stress is basically applied the unit area and the stress is measured the deformation area of the applied by the stress. So he has go from the original, which is here and goes to the 24 hours, 12 hours, 6 hours, 2 hours over the period of time. The original has around 0. 0.5 megapascal and the strain of 0. 0.3. And when we keep it the time for the zero hours, it has its breaks in 0. 0.2 and over the period it increases. So recovery time, almost 80%, the self-filling property was recovered by using this kind of, uh, this kind of smart molecules. So next we can switch to the application, which is talking about the tissue engineering application. So what is tissue engineering? So why it is necessary? How do we use these smart materials? How is it done? What are the applications application and where are we now? And why do we use this, this kind of smart materials in the tissue engineering application? So what's this tissue engineering? It's an emerging technology, emerging technology where artificial organ and tissues are constructed in vitro and transplanted in vivo for the recovery of lost or malfunctioned organs and tissues. So it's basically 
when you lost the tissues or the organs, that how do we create the synthetic material? It's a combination of cells, engineering methods, and also material that suitable biochemical, physiochemical factors, and how do we replace biological function? It contains a lot of factors. So why it is necessary? The here is that most tissues cannot regenerate following a disease or injury. The permanent implants have a lot of success, but also a lot of problems. And transplantation is limited by the scarcity of that donor tissue. Even a tissue that regenerates spontaneously, as by example, skin or bone, may not completely to do so. So another the important is that how it works. So it has development of such construct require a careful selection of foci materials. One is scaffolds, which we'll talk about that, how material, how do we polymer and the material will be selected. There's another most biology, which is, I'm not going to talk on growth factor and how do we select the extracellular matrix and how it sells. So here, the why the smart materials plays an important role here is that if you look at any tissue engineering material, we prepare the material, create the porosity and different porosity and grow a cells on the surfaces of the material. Honestly, we do not know exactly what kind of Morph, what kind of morphological uh, or you know pora, porous structure material do we need for our body? We have a different type of cell. We have a neuron cell. We have a diabetic cell. Some also, someone has a cancer cell. How do we select the, the good uh, morphological or a porous structure of the material for the different cell? So people have prepared different morphology and the different porosity structure. So our idea is that instead of preparing thousand uh, scaffold or thousand structured based materials, why don't we bring the smart materials, particularly light responsive materials, where you can use a smart material and light as external source and can change the properties of the material and engineer the cells and how the cell recognize and how the cell behaves with the different cell lines. So in detail, bioengineering, many people are used this kind of material with the magnetic nanoparticles, kind of a microfluidic channels, microbeads, the optical fibers and the surface rigidity. So they have, people have started creating a different morphological structure with different uh, responsive materials. And basically how it cell engineering works, this is a cell and this is a nucleus. And how the, this cell body, which is cytoplasm, how the cell body we can stretch are the mechanical deformation of the cell body and how the nucleus stretch and how the nucleus, how the nucleus we can stretch or elongate the nucleus, what degree we can uh, orient or the rotation of these uh, cells. So the, how do we use our uh, smart materials? Here we come towards the next generation of cell interaction material from static, which people use the static way to the dynamic way. So need for synthetic material that can recapitulate the continuous remodeling of natural extracellular matrix. Here we use the stimuli responsive polymers. Use light as external trigger. It is spatial control and it's a contact lex and it's compatible with the cell culture. So how do we track? So to do the track single topographic cube, we have prepared the also benzene based molecules. This is also benzene and we have a polymer and we spin coat it on the surface and they grow as cells, different cells on the material. Here we use the confocal or any laser volume. Here you create, as I said, that how the other benzene molecules aggregate in the confocal volume. You create the region of interest and draw a line on the region of interest, as the benzene molecules start aggregating, and that creates a channel or kind of pattern. And you can create a different pattern. So create this triangular shape of pattern, and also you can create spherical shape or a circle shape, and you can engineer the cells. Look at that, at how the cytoplasm and the cells of the nucleus are trying to orient along the direction of the grooves. So here is the, when you turn off the light, it is a zero. Look at the monitor by using the AFM. It is a zero topology. When we exit it with the 200 nanosecond, create a small pattern with the 200 to 300 nanometer deep. This is the cell, how the cells are trying to orient along the direction of the grooves. And you can erase the pattern with a different wavelength at a room temperature. And you rewrite the pattern in the vertical Line and look at that and the horizontal side and look at that how the cells are trying to orient along the, the along the direction of the grooves. 
So this process works kind of a, we have a light, this light goes undergoes the chemical process, the photoisomerization. This induces the mechanical movement, which is exactly how the neurons work. Neurons goes from the thermal and converts into the electrical signal, electrical to the chemical process. And this is the how we can track and the spatial control, spatial control that how the, in the single space, how do we control that? So this is a zero dimension. We grow cells on the surfaces. And when we create the channel or the pattern, the how the cells and cell body and the nucleus are trying to orient the direction of the grooves, which are creating the triangular shape or the circle shape. So I'll show the video how it works in the real in. So we have created the vertical direction. Then look at that how cells moving, and how can we engineering engineer this material. So when we erase the pattern and change the direction of the cells and cells try to migrate and move of which we created on the, substrate, on the substrate. And similar, you can create this direction. Look at that, how the cells and the cytoplasm body cell body is elongating and how we can stretch and how we can engineer this material. So these are the spin coated materials and also people can go to the, they have question is that when we spin coated material, people ask that, can we, when we use in the biological medium, doesn't, can sometime it can come out from the surfaces. So for that, the best example, best way is to address that is the polymer brushes. So which are covalently bonded to the surface. You can create a polymer brushes from few 200 to 300 nanometer, use a laser as a light source and create a pattern and use the sonication technique. Sonication is method which create the mechanical force to destroy or the disturb the surfaces. By using the sonication technique, also you can vanish the pattern and the process is reversible. Use a laser light source and you create a, create a channel of 200 to 300 nanometer and apply sonication, I can, you can vanish the pattern. You can use in the in vitro studies by using the cell, different cell line, like from diabetes, cancer, uh, or the endothelial or fibroblast cell line, different cell line. And with the cell line in the selector, it depends on the size of the cell as well. So you can also use the sonication technique. You can erase the pattern and you can see that how cells are trying to orient uh, along the direction of the grooves are created the pattern. So next question is, can we use this surface as a two-dimensional way? So what will be two-dimensional way? So when we, can we use this two-dimensional surface for the moving or transferring the biomolecules or the liquids or the water from one end to another end? So yes, people, we can use this molecule, this uh, surfaces to transfer the ions, uh, molecules or the liquids. Here we use molecules, they have a membrane, which is a porous structure membrane. And you have DNA molecules, which is can capture the ATP. And when we go for the vis uh, so visible light, it captures and UV light, it releases. So explain, I will explain how it works. You have a membrane, a kind of a polymer brushes. The polymer brushes, one end contains the azobenzene molecules. These azobenzene molecules with connected with the DNA molecules, we have DNA, we have a different series of peptide molecules. So when this excited with visible light, when we go for the visible light, this works with visible light, it undergoes the photoisomerization of transtosis. And during transtosis, it bends. When it bends, it folds at the DM molecules. During the folding structure, it can capture the ATP. And we keep it in UV light at, uh, and uh, in the different medium, it can release the ATP phase. This is the mechanism of how we do works. So how the DNA molecules look like? We have a DNA with a lot of amino acid, which is duanine and adenine and the guanine. And this is the structure of the ATP. So these most dimension that the DNA has a diameter of two, two nanometer and the capturing is 0.34 nanometer, which is bending and unfolding structure is perfect to capture the biomolecules, which are ATP molecules. And it can release when it goes from uh, uh, after photosomerization uh, from folding to the unfolding chemistry. And the length is almost 3.4 nanometer, which is perfectly fine to capture this kind of ATP molecules. So then can we use this surfaces to transfer or the move 
are the biomolecules or the nanoparticles, which is the toughest challenge that can we transfer the nanoparticles from one end to another end without touching or without adding any you know, chemical reagent. People usually use with the red axe. Red axe is, is a process of oxidation and reduction. It works in the simultaneously. So for the red axe polymer, red axe reaction, we need to add some chemical reagent, which can act as red axe and oxidation. So here we use the smart surfaces. You can use the smart surfaces, say two dimensional, use a glass or silicon, any substrate, grow your polymer brushes of as a benzene based molecule, as pyrophoran based molecule, which are light responsive. So here you have a side chain of spirofiron and somehow you can use this as a benzene. And here use a kind of radical polymerization technique. The best way to how it works, can measure the contact angle measurement from hydrophobic to the hydrophilic. So here is, before excitation, it is hydrophobic. So after excitation, it puts the hydrophilic, which is 55 degree, 85 to the 55. And with the same, with in the case of as a benzene, you can go from the hydrophobic to the hydrophilic region by measuring the contact angle. So how it works. So you measure as polymer brushes, you have a polymer brushes here, you drop a liquid or the nanoparticles or the biomolecule solution here, then use as a laser as a light source. And this light source, although you can move uh, this light source, go undergo uh, this light source, excite these molecules like azobenzene and the spirofiron. Those molecules undergo photoisomerization. This photoisomerization of the uh, you know, hydrophobic to the hydrophilic duration, these biomolecules move on the surface. So can people try to use the different solvent with the different density of the solvent, go from aqueous to the organic solvents, water, ethylene glycol, ethyl acetate, IPA, glycerol, phenol, and even goes from the oil phase like a silicon oil and also vegetable oil and move to the biomolecules, DNA molecule solution, and also for the nanoparticle solution. So let me explain how it works. So this is how it works. You have a biomolecular solution, and this is a before excitation, and this is after excitation. We call as the advancing and the receding angle. So this is called advancing angle, and the, this is called the receding angle. That, that how do we check whether the, any eye droplet or the biomolecules moves on the surface? First, we need to measure the advancing and the receding angle. Uh, so if it's a advancing angle, the smaller than the receding angle, which means that it creates the motion. How? During this photoisomerization, the molecules produce a lot of dipolar movement. This dipolar movement creates a force with, on the surface. This dipolar movement forces, it pulls the droplet on by water or the liquid on the surfaces. This force is enough to you know, move the molecules or uh, the nanoparticles on the system. The example, the video, I can show that how it works. So when we have a biomolecule solution on the surface, when you apply the light, the biomolecules start moving on the surfaces. So this is how we can create from, you know, go from the single molecular to the macromolecular and the gel chemistry, we can use a two dimensional and also you can go for the three dimensional surface, three dimensional, uh, which are kind of a gel network uh, system. With this, uh, I will close my presentation about uh, slight responsive molecules. I would like to acknowledge thanks to the different funding source, uh, different university, which goes from University of Alberta, ITT Lee, and UAUC and National Magnetic Lab and uh, funding agencies. Uh, thank you so much for the listening and uh, let's go for the discussion. And if you have any question, I would be very happy to answer. And if you're something which you did not follow it, please, you know, ask me, then I can go back to slide and explain in detail that how it works. Thank you, Dr. David Samaran for uh, an interesting and uh, informative talk on smart materials. Now it's uh, time for asking questions. If participants has any questions, they can post in the chat box. Hi, Ravi. That's the height of applied research, I would say. Mm -hmm. Nice talk.
Thank you. Uh, so I have a general uh, like question, just a scenario in India. I mean, mm. uh, like we know, like in India, uh, the academic and industrial research never mm. uh, goes um, hand in hand. So, yeah. so uh, like uh, you have a great like long industry experience before uh, moving on to the research. So, mm. like, uh, what's your uh, suggestion to the students, those who are uh, like interested in research and also thinking about going for a job? Like, should they go for a job first before research, or does it help, or they should go for research first? Like, what's your take on that? Okay, thank you. It's a, it's so tough question, but I would say that depends on the interest. Some people are so fascinated about the research, how the research works. The industry works with the, taking the proof of concept from some university or the, some paper or some patent. So they do. They most of the industries job. Of course, they one interesting thing is that whatever you do, we know that one other day reach the audience. That you are happy that you you worked on the you know product that reached to the audience. But do they generate the proof of concept like a real research? For me, no. They take the proof of concept from you know collaborating with the big big university, the big big institute, the people where they generate and spark the real ideas. But that de- completely depends on the interest. But is what motivates to do research is that it's complete. I think it's complete. The how the best example that's why I showed that how do we motivate ourselves? The how nature does. Like if the look at the nature, how our body functions. That you know how heart works in our body what is the behavior the complete works on the and also for example covid um, how do we how can we capture the particle how to how can we capture those viruses this both basically we think that the biology but those are chemistry these are protein molecules that are polymer peptides so it completely involves a lot of chemistry uh, but the research and the industry side is hard to you know Uh, say that which is uh, interesting or not that depends on the individual person how they motivate themselves i would say the academic is the best to you know do a research and do a lot of fascinating research and come up with a new ideas and develop ideas which can many industries can be used use or can be anyone can be use that those kind of techniques yeah academic is kind of have a scope of doing your own research and of course you may not your product may not reach soon like you know in few years it take may long time but academic is always has a scope of you know motivating and motivating others and uh, teaching to you know getting uh, help from the juniors seniors many things are involved so yes of course i can i would prefer academic mm mm-hmm. thank you Uh, i think there are no questions from participants side we can conclude this program uh, now i request uh, mrs greeny k to propose vote of thanks good morning all on behalf of the prestigious institution christ college in yalakuda i take this opportunity to propose vote of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this webinar on light or forced regard smart molecular switches for bioengineering application organized by department of chemistry our most respected principal reverend dr jolie andrew cmi the backbone of all the activities in the college under his guidance and leadership christ college so high on behalf of department of chemistry i extend and sincere thanks to reverend dr jolie andrew cmi principal thank you father for your enthusiastic support the ability to influence key properties of the molecular system by using light or force holds much promise for the field of material science and life sciences the cornerstone of such system is molecules that are able to reversibly isomerizes between two states such molecular switches tremendously extend the scope of molecular switchable systems for future applications and technologies i thank our chief guest and resource person dr devichandran h kolari gowda for the interesting presentation today's webinar was full of knowledge and interesting things i gave 
deep insight into the topic and also revealed some interesting facts. I'm pretty sure the precious knowledge that Dr. Devichandran gave us will definitely help us in our studies and future. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Devichandran for taking out time for his busy schedule and enlightening us with the knowledge. Thank you, sir. We are really enlightened with your presence. Dr. V.D. Joy, HOD, Department of Chemistry. He's actually our inspiration for all the activities in the department. On behalf of all my fellow faculty members in the department, I extend a sincere gratitude to Dr. V.D. Joy, our head of the department. Thank you so much, sir. I extend special thanks to Dr. Dijo Damien, faculty member, Department of Chemistry, for the timely help and support provided for this webinar a success. Thank you, sir. Our sincere thanks to all the faculty members from different institutions in India and abroad for attending this webinar. Thank you all for your gracious presence. I also extend our sincere gratitude to the technical team for their support in the smooth conduction of this webinar. On behalf of chemistry department, I extend a special thanks to Dr. Tom Cherian, convener of this webinar series, who really worked hard to make this event successful. Thank you, sir, for your support and coordination. Last but not the least, all the students participate in the webinar. Thank you all for your presence in this webinar. With these kind words, we move to the end of today's webinar series. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. It was my pleasure. Thanks, Ravi, once again. Time for you to sleep. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Devi <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's 12 here. Midnight. It's, it's midnight for him. <laughs>